Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Civil Procedure. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and uh, and staying warm and dry. All right. So, uh, what are we up to today? Well, um, we're going to start with this Grossman case. You've had four cases today. A lot of news for today. Uh, the Grossman case is um, kind of the appetizer. It tells us about um, privilege, but Grossman is also a good review of kind of the ethos and philosophy uh, around disclosure and production in the Ontario rules. And then the main course is these three big, juicy Supreme Court of Canada cases, which uh, outline the three three of the four types of privilege which are recognized in, uh, in our common law system. Okay, uh, so privilege of, uh, is stage five on our conventional civil action road to justice. We've been talking a lot about discovery and about the general policy of trying to encourage the disclosure of all relevant documents so that the truth can come out. We talked last time about some of the things that limit that discovery obligation, um, the tendency to insert proportionality as a consideration, uh, for example, and of course relevance is the limit on, on discovery of all types. Uh, but today we get to privilege, which is a more kind of philosophically grounded and complex basis for resisting the disclosure of documents or I should say resisting the production of documents which would otherwise be uh, be producible. So I get this wrong too. Everyone, uh, everyone is um, can easily fall into confusion between the difference between discovery or sorry between disclosure and production. Right, disclosure being alerting other parties to the existence of a document, production being actually making that document available to them. And uh, privilege, we'll see, is a limit on production, but not a limit on, uh, on disclosure, because you're still required to disclose the existence of all documents over which you claim uh, relevance, or which you claim privilege. And I've been using the phrase documents, but of course, the concept of privilege is not just about restricting the production of documents, but is also about restricting the, the production of evidence of all kinds. Right? So privilege is also a legitimate basis to refuse to answer a question in examination for discovery. Or, uh, you know, we went over our toolbox of, dis of uh, discovery techniques last time. Uh, if you, um, in principle, you could uh, make a claim of privilege about uh, to resist uh, a Rule 32 motion, right? If there's um, some sort of property, there's a basis to on which to claim that um, the property is subject to a privilege claim. I can't really think how that would work. The point is that privilege is a shield to discovery and can in principle uh, shield a production of, uh, of, of any of these types. All right, so the MA versus Ryan case uh, gives us a good statement of uh, the general philosophy behind discovery and privilege. The fundamental proposition is that everyone owes a general duty to give evidence relevant to the matter before the court so the truth may be ascertained. To this fundamental duty, the law permits certain exceptions, known as privileges, where it can be shown that they are required by a public good transcending the normally predominant principle of utilizing all rational means for ascertaining truth. So think of them as uh, car votes to or, or exceptions to the general expectation of full disclosure. Okay. I should also say, of course, that um, the privilege will also work to shield uh, evidence at trial. So not just in the sort of pretrial discovery technique, but you also uh, cannot be required to answer questions about privileged information or provide privileged evidence at trial. All right, so um tells us about how we actually deal with this tension between uh, discovery and, and privilege. Uh, so this is the Toronto General Hospital. You've probably seen it at um, university and college in Toronto. 
the oldest hospital in Toronto, Ontario. Looks pretty impressive from the outside. And uh, I'm sure they generally run a fairly tight ship. But when it came to Mr. Grossman, they definitely seem to have dropped the ball, to say the very least. So uh, the first paragraph of the case tells us that poor Mr. Grossman was discovered dead after 12 days in an air duct shaft in this hospital. Now, uh, Grossman was a brain surgery patient. He wasn't necessarily the easiest guy to keep in one place. But uh, TGH still does not look very good here, right? They didn't even start lure him until 48 hours after he disappeared. And then it took them 10 days to actually come across him once they started looking. The plaintiffs in this case are Mr. Grossman's relatives. They are understandably angry. They want to know what the heck happened. Uh, they want an explanation, an apology, and maybe damages as well for what they've had to go through. So they sue the hospital. And uh, what they get um, oops, is described oops, sorry, no, I'm thinking here, uh, as a general traverse. It's a denial of the plaintiff's claims, right? So a traverse is an old-fashioned way to say that they are simply denying everything that the plaintiff claims to be true. Okay, so so what is wrong? What is wrong with that, right? I mean, you've learned in uh, in criminal law that if you're accused of something, right, your accuser, uh, at least for the crown, has to prove everything that they claim you did beyond a reasonable doubt, and you are entirely entitled to put the crown to their onus of, of, of doing that. So why, why is the judge mad at Toronto General Hospital for having issued a statement of defense, which is a, a general traverse? Uh, there's, a, there's a specific rule and a specific concept about pleadings and statements of defense. So I'm thinking of this rule back at the beginning here, right? Um, the rules about, uh, about defenses, rule 25.07. Um, a party shall admit every allegation um, that you do not dispute. And uh, that, that underlies the policy of, uh, of, of requiring defendants to kind of play ball, to engage with what the plaintiff is claiming uh, and think carefully about how they want on to it. It's, it's really kind of like the defendant is just being lazy in an unacceptable way if they simply deny it all and make the plaintiff do so. And in this case, clearly the, the hospital is denying things which they have no business denying. And there's definitely things here that, uh, that Toronto General Hospital should be admitting, right? Uh, for example, the fact that he's dead. Um, and it's not just the fact that he's dead, they, they should be, uh, they should really be engaging with the, with the case and, and thinking more closely about what exactly they want to, uh, to admit, deny, and make other pleas about. All right, so, uh, so we get to the pleadings and we get to the discovery stage and um, Grossman's, host, Grossman's family wants to know what happened. They want to get at the facts. So they or their lawyer opens up the toolbox of discovery and um, they, uh, I asked you a question, which one of these tools they used? This one, yeah. Uh, so we have documents, that's right. Um, uh, this is not a case about oral questioning, right? This is about examination for discovery is the oral questioning technique. Here we're talking about documents. They want um, the hospital to make fulsome disclosure of all relevant documents and if they're going to make any privilege claims to make them um, make them explicit. So it all comes down to the documents, right? This, uh, and this is something which is, you know, usually true. The documents are often where the real action is. Uh, you know, if this were, um, if this were CSI or something, uh, then the truth would emerge from some sort of medical examination of the dead body, or uh, there would be some some hints or some physical evidence that would say what, what, what happened. In reality, especially when you're dealing with large institutional litigants, they have paper trails, and that's how you find out what, what actually happened. <coughs> so, uh, I mean, 
what what documents in particular? If, you, if you're on for uh, for Grossman, uh, what documents do you think the hospital might have that would help you get at the truth of what happened to your grandfather? Okay, yeah, for, they might they might well have have records that talked about uh, what, what he was doing. Sure. Um, maybe some account of when he went missing or any proof that they called the police or filed a report. Absolutely, yeah. So maybe there's like a a voicemail memo left by you know um, someone over a nurse in this ward saying, "Look, Mr. Grossman, um, his 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 uh, room is over here, and last Tuesday we found him wandering all the way over here. So that would be evidence that this guy is you know mobile." and uh, uh, you know, evidence that they knew there was a problem, which in turn helps you build a case that they weren't properly taking care of him. Uh, okay, yeah, other great ideas here. In internal policies on lost persons because, uh, okay, well, who can tell us that they've got a policy um, about, about lost persons or like a, you know, a protocol for, for wanderers. Um, how, how might that help Grossman's family make their case. What might this policy have to do? Because a policy, I mean, and, and Danielle's quite right. Yeah, that's right. There we go. Negligence, um, duty of care, right? An internal policy, if that exists and you fall, fall below it, uh, then that is evidence of negligence. So, uh, so, so that's, that's a good point that relevant documents are not necessarily just, you know, the ones about the documents pertaining to the factual issues in dispute. But a document can also be relevant if it helps you make your legal case. If it helps you establish the, the, the standard of care, the duty of care, which in turn lets you, you know, make your legal argument that they fell below it. So relevance can be about a contested factual issue, but relevance can also be about a contested legal issue. Okay, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Mallory said uh, an investigation report, right? So that could be the smoking gun if they actually, um, you know, had a concerted effort to look for the guy or, um, you know, even better, the hospital vice president say, okay, you guys are in charge of going to look for the guy, uh, but then they didn't go look for the guy and that's how he ended up dying. That would be a terrific smoking gun from the plaintiff's point of view. Um, so this was 1982 when this case happened. Um, what what records might uh, exist if the case were to if this were to happen today instead of in 1982? What additional records might be relevant and disclosable? Yes, cameras and videotape footage. Absolutely, that counts as uh, that counts as a document. Um, computer records, emails going back and forth about what happened to the guy. Online logs, patient check-in. Yeah, I mean these hospitals are full of you know RFID scanners and, and whatnot. Um, so as we learned from that e-discovery video, there would be a whole mountain of information um, in, if this happened in 2019 that would not have existed in, uh, in 1982. Okay, so um, this is what Grossman's family wants, and they have good reason to want it. Uh, what position does the hospital take? in terms of this question of the disclosure and production of documents. What documents are they, will, are they willing to, uh, are, are they not willing to produce any documents whatsoever? Yeah, that's right. Uh, they, they, they think they're willing to produce um, his hospital record, right? Um, uh, which of course exists for every patient in the hospital. Wow, thanks, right? You've given us um, something which tells us absolutely nothing. Um, and and for, as far as documents going beyond that, they take the position at paragraph 17 that uh, the plaintiffs have failed to establish that any documents exist that should be produced. This is paragraph uh, 17, right? Um, plaintiffs have failed to establish any documents exist that should be produced other than this medical record. Um, so, uh, and, and they say that, you know, it's either because there are no documents or in the alternative, because those documents are privileged. Um, we don't know whether the documents are privileged, right? Um, we don't, there's no finding in this case about whether the claim of privileges is, uh, is appropriately made. 
But what the judge does say here that's really important is that um, we don't know. We, you have not given us enough information to evaluate your claim of privilege. So you remember when we were talking about pleadings, right? We said that you can plead in the alternative, right? We're gonna, we want to win. We should win. Um, but we should win either because of story X or because of story Y. And that's fine. You can't do that with documents. You cannot do that in an affidavit of documents. For each and every relevant document you're not producing, you need to have a specific claim for why you're not producing it. And the other side should not have to take your word for it if you just say it's, it's privilege, right? The other side, under the principle of audi alterum partem, has to have an opportunity to contest your claim of privilege. So uh, rule, paragraph 19, we have rule 347, which is the old rule. Um, but the law is basically the same today, right? That you have to specify each and every document and, and if you're not gonna produce them, say why. Under the old law, the court had the power to compel disclosure on a motion, but the party seeking disclosure would usually have to proactively bring that motion in order to get the other side to do it. That's a really key difference between the old law and today's law, that now every party with relevant documents is required to actively disclose and produce them without being subject to a motion to do so. So the rest of this case basically gives us the, um, the ancient and worthy precedents for, for this policy we have. And um, can anyone remember, in terms of the mechanics of it, what document and what part of, a, of the document you would use now to make a claim of privilege? If you have documents which are relevant but privileged, how precisely do you present that claim of privilege to the other parties? So you do it in Schedule B, and uh, I think I showed you this already. You do it, um, uh, this is a part of an actual Schedule B. You do it in a way that, uh, that states the privilege without, um, without destroying it, right? So the whole point of privilege is to protect something which is, which is private, and you have to uh, state the ground of privilege, but you are not required, of course, to provide more details, which would obviate the whole point of privilege by by giving away uh, whatever it is that you're um, you're trying to keep secret. All right, so uh, paragraph 45, we have an important statement that you've um, probably more. Litigation is a search for truth. Litigation is a search for truth, uh, which is which is worth keeping in mind because it's worth keeping in mind throughout your career uh, as a civil litigator because. Uh, for your client, typically litigation will not be a search for truth, right? People don't come to lawyers and spend all this money because they want to search for truth. They come to lawyers because they feel wronged. They feel that their <clears throat> legal rights have been infringed. But for the court, it's always a search for truth. And for us as lawyers, it's also supposed to be uh, a search for truth. And that's part of the ethical obligation of lawyers in the context of civil procedure, insofar as uh, to the extent that it has, has other motives, you are trying to guide the client and ensure the client comports themselves in civil litigation in a manner which is consonant with this search for truth. And we saw, I think, already the rule which reminds us of that, the rule of professional conduct. Um, I didn't put it in these slides, but you've you've seen it before, right? That there, there's a, I think we talked about this last week, how how lawyers have this uh, fundamental obligation to assist their clients in making full disclosure uh, and resist and, if necessary, withdraw from a case to avoid being part of a client's effort to intentionally frustrate the search for truth by making abusive claims of privilege or just, uh, you know, accidentally failing to find and disclose relevant documents. All right, so uh, so the hospital has not done the right thing here, and um, it falls to the court to consider the remedy. 
what are we going to do about this infraction of, of the rules by the hospital? So it's the sort of bad behavior, this business of a, making abusive claims of privilege and failing to abide by rule 30. It's the sort of bad behavior which is punished by cost awards. And that's what they're going to do here, right? There's going to be a cost award in favor of the Grossmans at the expense of, of their adversaries. But who exactly is to blame? Is it the lawyer's fault, the hospital's lawyer's fault, or is it the hospital itself? This comes up all the time, right? When, when courts are trying to use cost awards to punish bad behavior, um, who, if you punish the client, if you make the client pay, because co cost awards are typically paid for by the party, when it was actually the lawyer's fault, that's kind of unfair. Um, and why, why is it very hard to know? Like if in civil litigation, a party has been abusing the process, why is it very difficult for the court to ever know whether it was the client's bad behavior or the lawyer's bad behavior? Solicitor client privilege, right? What goes on between client and lawyer is shielded, it's private. So it's impossible to, to know typically um, which of them is, uh, is, is at fault for something like this. However, there's a bit of a hint at paragraph 47 uh, where the um, judge says, I was informed by counsel that the solicitor responsible for the defense uh, is the solicitor responsible for the co conduct of the defense herein, right? So that the hospital's lawyer was caught doing something very similar in a previous case. This is a great example of the smallness of the bar right, and the, the, the power of reputation in uh, if, if you end up being a civil litigator. If you do something shady like this once, people are going to hear about it, judges will hear about it, and even if, you're, if you don't do it again, um, people will sort of suspect you and they won't trust you the same way they would have if you kept your nose clean. And that's basically why um, uh, the uh, responsibility um, uh, they, they're inclined to blame the lawyer, not the hospital. So they, they consider a couple of options here, right? They, uh, what, what, they, what the court has the power to do is order the lawyer to pay the costs personally, an exceptional order, right? Costs, as I said, are typically paid by the party themselves. But uh, ultimately decide not to do that. They're going to make this cost award payable by the, by the hospital. But it kind of um, comes to the same thing, right? Because if you've got a sophisticated client like Toronto General Hospital and they're required to pay extra cost to the other side because you're their lawyer and, you know, you screwed up, then you're probably going to have to comp the fee anyway, right? They're, they're going to require you to base or, or your firm to, to eat that cost. Uh, so it sort of, sort of comes to the same thing. Okay, so that's, um, I think, everything I wanted to say about Grossman. It kind of shows us where the philosophy we have around documentary disclosure comes from. Uh, it also illustrates the consequences and the kind of punitive power the court has uh, when parties are not discharging their ethical obligations. Because shot through this whole consideration of discovery is, you know, the reality that it's prone to abuse because no one on the outside knows what's going on inside this building, right? It's only the people inside who can possibly know what the documents are. And it's beyond the power of any adversary or of the court to get in there and dig and find out. So the law invents various mechanisms to try to compel litigants to make full disclosure, even though it's not in their immediate material self-interest to do so. All right, so we've been um, kind of beating around this concept uh, of privilege. Let's get into the, uh, into, into the weeds now, right? We've got uh, privileges, as we know, are exceptions to the general obligation to disclose relevant documents. Uh, we're going to talk about four major types of privilege that exist in Canadian law. First of all, solicitor-client privilege, protecting uh, communications between lawyers and their clients. Um, whoops, there's the rest of them. Oh, here they are. Uh, litigation privilege, protecting documents that are prepared 
for the purpose of litigation. Settlement privilege, which protects documents, communications used in pursuit of voluntary settlement of a case. And finally, case-by-case -case privilege, which protects other privacy interests, which are not covered by these other three. All right, so we'll do solicitor client, also known as lawyer client privilege first. So, uh, so solicitor client privilege has uh, a quasi-constitutional status that this case kind of explains. One of the things that's tricky about this case is that it's technically an administrative law case, but it was and it remains the leading authority of the Supreme Court of Canada for uh, solicitor client privilege cases in civil litigation as well as the administrative context. So could anyone perhaps tell us what happened to Colleen Pritchard? This is Colleen Pritchard here. How did, uh, how did she end up in litigation? What was her, what was her job and what, what happened to, to her job, to her at her job that gave rise to this complaint? Um, so she had filed a human rights complaint against her employer for harassment and gender discrimination. Um, so because the Human Rights Commission decided they didn't want to deal with her complaint and she wanted, uh, like she appealed on the basis that she wanted to see everything that the commission had looked at to, to come to that conclusion. Yes, thank you. That's, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, her employer, of course, was Sears. She, she'd been fired and then she brought this, uh, this human rights complaint afterwards. So a bit, a bit of context you need to know here is that in 2004, the Ontario human rights, with kind of a, a weird structure for adjudicating human rights complaints in Ontario, we had this human rights commission, which had the right to decide whether a matter would be heard by the human rights tribunal. So the Human Rights Tribunal was the one that could actually make orders and assess damages for violations of the Ontario Human Rights Code. But then the commission was a sort of gatekeeper uh, where, uh, and you could not get to the tribunal unless the commission decided that your case was meritorious enough to advance. So, so they decided that the, that the Human Rights Commission said, you cannot go forward with this case. So, so why was that? Was that because they'd looked into the workplace culture at Sears and decided that there actually was no discrimination or harassment, or they found her account not credible? Well, on what basis did they reach that conclusion? They said that she acted in bad faith because with her job, she had signed a release that she would never bring a claim under the Human Rights Code for her employer, and then she did it anyway. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, so this uh, is standard practice. If someone is terminated, or um, to uh, they'll be offered some type of severance or uh, pay in lieu of, lieu of notice. And in exchange, they will be asked to sign a release, releasing the employer from all claims, including human rights claims. But it's a matter of contested law whether that actually uh, always does prevent you from from bringing a claim of the type she did. Okay, um, so uh, the divisional court uh, quashed the commission's decision, right? So they say, no, you should let her matter go forward to the tribunal. Um, they said, go back and reconsider it. Paragraph eight, the commission uh, reconsidered it using these new principles, but reached the same conclusion, right? That no, she can't go ahead with this. Pritchard then seeks judicial review again of, uh, of, of what the commission has done here. And we're reading this case in the context of disclosure and privilege because Pritchard wanted a particular document. Can anyone tell us what document was it that Pritchard wanted and, and why she wanted that document? The legal opinion, right. Uh, and so this is the document uh, that the law firm or potentially an in-house lawyer at the Human Rights Commission would have provided to the commissioner, to the decision makers, um, saying what, what you should do with this case, right? So it's effectively, it's the reasons. This legal opinion is effectively the reasons, constitutes the reasons why the commission decided not to let her get to the tribunal. And maybe there are strong reasons, uh, but maybe they're not so strong. 
right? Maybe they say, you know, uh, the commissioners, are, we're, we're bored of hearing all these sexual harassment cases. We want to do some race-related cases instead. So let's just keep this out of the tribunal uh, because variety is the spice of life. Um, so if it was something like that or if it was something that was otherwise attackable, then that would let her, uh, that would give her traction in her case going forward. So she wants to get this letter, and her authority for doing so is actually comes from the Judicial Review Procedure Act, Section 10, which states that when notice of an application for judicial review of a decision made in the exercise of the reported exercise of statutory power uh, has been served on the person, that person shall forthwith file in the court for use in the application the record of the proceedings in which the decision was made. Okay, so it's kind of a it's kind of complicated, right? Uh, you've taken an administrative law. I think everyone's taken a min law by this point. Uh, so you know that this Human Rights Commission is a oh some people haven't taken a min law. Um, oh wow, okay, all right. Well, let me let me back up a bit. Uh, so the government has created tens of thousands of agencies, boards, and commissions, right? Which is to say entities created under the law to exercise certain powers that have been delegated by the legislature or by parliament. And when one of those bodies does something that affects your interests, you have the right to seek judicial review, right? Which is to say a, a judge will, will review what they've done, like, uh, like appeal. It's the equivalent of appeal, but for administrative bodies like this, um, Human Rights Commission. So the Judicial Review Procedure Act is the statute which statute which governs judicial review, governs this process for appealing the administrative decisions. And it says that when any agency, board, or commission is, uh, uh, is subject to judicial review, it has to provide the record of the proceedings in which the decision was made, which means um, if, if the, the agency, board, or commission actually had a, some type of hearing, then uh, they've got to provide that record to the judge doing the review so so that the uh, so the uh, process can um, can make of all available evidence okay so so Colleen Pritchard's argument is that this legal opinion is part of the record of the proceedings and therefore it has to be furnished to the judicial review process so this is this is a kind of like sec rule 30, right? Rule 30, our documentary disclosure rule, um, where uh, it's a document which is relevant and there's an authority for, for having it put forward. Um, so she says it should go forward. The Ontario Human Rights Con Commission says, wait a minute. Yes, it's relevant, but it's also privileged. It's a legal opinion prepared by our lawyer for us. Okay. So um, the court, because this is going to be the precedent for solicitor my privilege in civil procedure and administrative procedure both, uh, they have give us a review of the rationale and law of, of solicitor client privilege. Can anyone tell us, um, either from this case or from what you may remember from other courses, what is the rationale for solicitor client privilege? Why would we possibly want to prevent relevant information and evidence from coming to light just because it passed between a lawyer and their client? Uh, hi, it says at uh, paragraph 14, clients must feel free and protected to be frank and candid with their lawyers with respect to their affairs so that the legal system, as we have recognized it, may properly function. Okay, okay, that's great. So the system can properly function. Uh, that's quite true. There's also um, an argument about compliance that, you, you know, if we want people to abide by the law and obey it, solicitor client privilege will actually increase compliance. What's, what's that all about? So, so there's a reason why, if we didn't have solicitor client privilege, corporate defendants in particular might break the law more often. One of the things that lawyers do that's useful is tell people what the law is and encourage people to follow the law, encourage their clients to follow the law, right? And if 
clients don't believe that their conversations with their lawyers will be confidential, then they'll stop telling their lawyers about things they want to do, which may or may not be illegal. And if the lawyers don't know about those things, then they won't be able to provide that advice about where the bounds of legality end. And pe people will end up breaking the law more often, in particular corporate, corporate clients. So in addition to everything people have said, there's also this argument about how solicitor client privilege enhanced compliance with the law by, by, by protecting those conversations and encouraging them to occur. Okay, so a few more things here uh, in, in, in the case, right? They, they kind of give us a helpful rundown of what, uh, what solicitor client privilege is all about. Um, they tell us that it does not protect uh, information communications without legal advice being sought or offered. So it's not just any conversation you have with your lawyer. If your lawyer is also, uh, you know, your neighbor and you talk to, to your lawyer neighbor about um, cutting the lawn, then that's not privileged. There's no legal advice being sought or offered. Uh, does not protect communications not intended to be private. Uh, and it also does not uh, protect information um, uh, which is meant to advance an unlawful course of, of conduct. So it's not supposed to be a shield that intentionally uh, law-breaking actors can use to try to, to, try to uh, shield their wrongdoing from disclosure. But other than that, exceptions are quite rare. This is something the law takes, uh, takes very seriously, right? The privilege must be nearly absolute. Exceptions will be rare. The fact that it's an in-house lawyer does not, is not, doesn't constitute an exception. So if a corporation employs a lawyer full-time, uh, the conversations between other corporate employees and that lawyer are privileged, just as it would be for outside counsel. And um, so for, for, for those reasons, um, procedural fairness, you know, al del terum partum, trying to do the right thing, uh, can never require the disclosure of any privileged document. So one of the things that kind of um, surprises people about this case, or one of the things that's weird about this case, is that the state is not on the side where we expect to find it in a solicitor client privilege case, right? The classic solicitor client privilege cases arose in the criminal context, where you've got uh, a person accused of the crime, you've got the entire uh, awesome power of the state opposed to them. That person is sometimes said to perhaps have no other friend in the world other than their, their defense lawyer who is there standing up for them. And in those classic criminal cases, it's, it's all about solicitor client privileges, about um, standing up for that person against the state and protecting that relationship against the power of the state. Here, it's exactly the opposite. The party claiming solicitor client privilege is itself a branch of the state, the Ontario Human Rights Commission, a well-resourced, established um, administrative body created by the government of Ontario. And they're trying to use solicitor client privilege against an individual to shield their reasons for, uh, for, for acting as they did. So it was open to the court to say, you know what, this is a different context, right? We're not talking about criminal law. We're not talking about restraining the power of the state anymore. So we're going to narrow solicitor client privilege. That is not what happens. Instead, the court uses it, take this opportunity to emphasize that solicitor client privilege applies equally in the civil context as it, as it does in the criminal context. And it applies for the benefit of a state party to the same extent that it applies for the benefit of a private party. It also extends, they say, to non-litigious advice. So you don't have to have a litigated matter um, to, to give rise to solicitor client privilege, nor, as I said, do you have to have uh, outside counsel as opposed to in-house counsel. Okay, so um, the interesting here, uh, we get into kind of a discussion of how this judicial uh, review procedure act should be interpreted right and this section 
Section 10 does not say anything about privilege, right? It was open to the legislature when they were drafting this to have written uh, the court has to, uh, the, the body uh, under review, the body subject to judicial review has to furnish um, the record of all the proceedings in which the decision was made, except those portions which are privileged, subject to solicitor client privilege. They didn't do so. So uh, Pritchard said, well, that means that, you know, privilege doesn't apply, right? The legislature is supreme and, and this is what they've done. They have they have not included privilege here. So why did that why did that argument fail? Given that the legislature has quite clearly, there is no way you can read this paragraph so that uh, it incorporates any sense of solicitor client privilege. Why is it then that Pritchard's argument about that failed, and the court's going to? apply solicitor client privilege anyway. Because solicitor client privilege is, I mean, statute like this is superior, it, it ousts the common law, right, where, where it exists. And I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in the charter, right? So, so if you look at the charter, uh, the charter has been interpreted to protect solicitor client privilege in cases where someone's liberty is at stake. That's not the case here. Solicitor client privilege cannot be abrogated by inference. And uh, so I think what they're saying is that even though it doesn't specifically come right out and say it, the attorney-client privilege is such like a common law tradition that you cannot infer that its omission in a legislation means that they meant to to say that it doesn't matter or that it's that it's not still controlling. Like attorney-client privilege is, is so fundamental that, you know, just because it's not specifically written doesn't mean that it's not specifically included. Yes, I think that's a very good way to, to explain it. Um, that it remains within their power. The legislature can oust it with the statute, but they have to do so explicitly. And if they have not done so explicitly, if they just failed to mention it, then the inference will be that it, that it survives. Right? So it's kind of like the, this idea, you know, the Constitution, we, we know that constitutional principles trump legislation. But here we have kind of like a quasi-constitutional principle, which can still be trumped by legislation, but can only be trumped explicitly by legislation and cannot be ousted implicitly by, by legislation, which simply, legislation like this, which simply doesn't, doesn't mention it. Okay, so solicitor client privilege is going to apply. Now we apply it to the facts. Uh, the um, paragraph 36, uh, basically this legal opinion is privileged. Colleen Pritchard is not going to get it, um, despite, uh, despite everything she might say. Now, what would, let me ask you this, what would, if there were no privilege for this, right, if this decision had gone the other way, how might the Ontario Human Rights Commission alter its practice. This is part of the, the policy argument behind solicitor client privilege. If it didn't have it, then, um, then entities like uh, the OHRC would start behaving differently and not in a good way. So how, how do you think they might behave differently? How might they alter their internal processes if they were to be told that solicitor client privilege does not apply to documents like this legal opinion. So running everything through their lawyer would not would not be logical, right? If they were to if they were to be told that privilege uh, does not apply. Okay, yeah, we're getting uh, we're getting good uh, good ideas here. Uh, start without legal advice, um, so you know it, it diminishes the incentive to even ask a lawyer about about what you should do if that's not going to be private. Um, and Sarah also has a good point here. If they do talk to their lawyers, they are less likely to keep records or notes about it, because you recall that if something is if a conversation has no records or notes, and that conversation is relevant and non-privileged, 
then you are required to answer questions about it in an examination for discovery. But if you've got notes that are relevant and non-privileged, then you have to disclose them um, automatically without the other side having to ask about them. So if solicitor client privilege is weakened, that, that increases the uh, incentive to not keep notes, right? To not have paper trails for anything. And if you're gonna get advice from your lawyer, just have a phone call, just talk to them in the hall. And that's not necessarily a good thing, right? I mean, we want our, our public agencies to act according to, to the law and to act on the basis of good advice. And um, that, I mean, having like, the lawyers write proper legal opinions, it's probably likely to be better advice than just say, you know, oh, you know, Joe, general counsel, you see him over coffee in the break room. It's like, what do you think we should do about this case? And Joe's like spitballing while he's thinking about his coffee. Better let him go back to his desk and write a proper opinion. And if we tell them that that opinion is going to have to be disclosed to the other side, then that opinion is less likely to be written in the first place. Okay. So that's that's kind of the, one of the policy considerations that's going on here and may help to explain a result that many people find kind of uh, kind of counterintuitive. All right, so, uh, so 15 to 16 is a good summary of um, what this is all about. Uh, you're shielded, the information is shielded if communication between a solicitor and a client which entails the seeking or giving of legal advice and which is intended to be confidential by the parties. Uh, and uh, it falls within the usual and ordinary scope of the professional relationship, including the pre-retainer period, uh, which is to say that someone who comes into a lawyer's office and starts telling their story, that communication is privileged, regardless of whether any formal retainer document has been signed uh, by those by those two. As long as it does not have the purpose of furthering unlawful conduct. So they're not going to let parties uh, intentionally send things to their lawyers uh, just for the purpose of advancing an unlawful scheme. Okay, so that's privilege, um, solicitor client privilege. Uh, Pritchard is a good case, first of all, for the extent and the depth of solicitor client privilege within the context of administrative law or civil litigation. And it also tells us about this idea of a quasi-constitutional status that a solicitor client privilege has and the extent that uh, the le legislature would have to go to if it wanted to host that. Okay, so we come now to um, our case on litigation privilege, and that's the case of blank versus Canada. So this is, uh, is Sheldon Blank. Uh, he runs a factory in Winnipeg. And Sheldon's basically been, uh, been dancing with the feds since 1995, right? Since 10 years before this judgment. He was charged with emitting pollutants into the Red River and with various failures to dis report and disclose environmental issues that arose in his factory, the government says. So these are quasi-criminal charges, right? And breaches of, uh, of environmental legislation were alleged. But Sheldon's doing pretty well, right? Most of the criminal charges and quasi-criminal charges against him have been quashed or dropped. But the feds keep on coming back at him and bringing new charges uh, against him. So he's fed up. He decides to turn the tables, and he wants some kind of redress for what he sees as this like never-ending campaign of harassment against him. He sues the government for fraud, conspiracy, perjury, and abuse of prosecutorial powers. The case is similar to Colleen Pritchard's case against the Ontario Human Rights Commission in many ways. Just like Colleen Pritchard, Sheldon is trying to get information from the government about their case. And also, like Pritchard, he is not using the rules of civil procedure, right? But the case is nonetheless important for civil procedure. He, like Pritchard, is using a statute. In, in her case, of course, it was the Judicial Review Procedure Act. He is in this access, uh, this access to information statute, right? So access to information legislation generally gives citizens the right to, uh, to receive copies and, and read government documents that would otherwise not be public on the principle that government should be open. 
And the government, again, is acknowledging that the stuff he's after, documents about their prosecutions of him, might be relevant, but they're resisting on the grounds of privilege. So they claim, um, you know, like all privileges, they, the government here is claiming that there is some type of public good transcending the normally predominant principle of utilizing all rational means for ascertaining truth. Okay, so what is, what is that public good in this case, right? They're, they're not, this isn't about solicitor client privilege. What is the public good? What is it they could justify from the government's point of view, refusing to disclose relevant documents, curtailing the search for truth? Okay, litigation privilege is the name of it. Can anyone tell us what what's the idea behind it? Why why should we care? Why should we protect documents like this? The the idea is that uh, is that we want parties to be able to put their best foot forward in litigation and kind of plan for how they're going to do so. So uh, it's sometimes analogized to, uh, you know, if you um, watch team sports, right, like, you know, the NFL or uh, baseball or hockey, right? There's often rules about communications, right? So the, the, the coach is allowed to uh, communicate with uh, the quarterback or with the pitcher um, and, uh, you know, using various types of secret code and signals. And uh, there's often rules in professional sports that you can't, inter you can't intercept the signals. And the point of that in, um, in, in sports is that the game will be better if each side can kind of, each team can prepare and execute its, uh, its strategy, right? So this is a little bit like that. Um, where uh, where the, the, the system is going to work better. The clash is going to be more effective at getting at the truth if, if parties have a similar protected sphere of privacy in which they can prepare their litigation position and consider what the adversary might say, right, without kind of giving it away to them. So the government's defense in this case, the reason why they say we should not have to disclose these relevant documents to blank is based on litigation privilege. Now, these two concepts are um, often confused, and they're somewhat similar, but there's, there's significant differences between them, and, and you need to know them both. Uh, as litigators, you need to know them both because there's many circumstances in which one, but not the other of these, is going to, um, is going to let you protect your client's interest. So, uh, so this chart is my effort to kind of tease out what exactly the differences are. Uh, solicitor client privilege it has to be there has to be a lawyer and a client involved and materials going between them. Litigation privilege it can be between a lawyer and client, but can also be between uh, a lawyer and a third party, or a self rep and a third party. Um, and uh, so, so if you have like a witness or someone else who is involved in some capacity and the document communic the communication went to them, then that can trigger litigation, cl litigation privilege. As far as the rationale and objective, uh, this litigation privilege is all about um, the efficacy of the adversarial process and having this protected area in which you can investigate and prepare your case. There's an important difference in what materials are covered. Solicitor client privilege can only cover communications, be they electronic, oral, or by letter. Litigation privilege can also cover non-communicative materials. So notes, right? If you're a self rep and you are getting your case ready and you take notes about the questions you want to ask, that's covered by litigation privilege, even though those notes are not intended for anyone but yourself. And non-confidential communications can also be covered by litigation privilege. It's kind of hard to, there are two circumstances in which this would matter, because if something was not, not confidential at all, if it was sort of publicly available, then 
generally the other side would know it and they the, the need to disclose it wouldn't arise in the first place. Solicitor client privilege, as we know from that will example, extends to materials which are not connected to litigation in any, in any way. Litigation privilege, as the name suggests, only applies to documents related to litigation in some way. Solicitor client privilege is permanent. So if you're a lawyer, you take your client's confidential information to the grave. That means not the client's grave, your grave. You cannot divulge this stuff ever. Litigation privilege is not permanent. Litigation privilege lasts certainly until the end of the case that gave rise to it, but it also, as we'll see, extends to the end of any closely related proceedings. So this is a recognition of the fact that when there is one thing which is fundamentally one civil dispute between parties, there will often be multiple cases arising from it. And if they're all basically about the same thing, then they're closely related proceedings and they sh it should be treated as if it were one big case for the point of view of figuring out when this litigation privilege comes to an end. Okay. Um, what's the issue in this particular case? Paragraph 22, the, the fundamental legal question here is whether documents once subject to litigation privilege remain privileged when the litigation ends. And the answer the court gives to that, so, so you know, this, this is important for Blank, right? Because this guy, um, you know, this is an epic bat war against the federal government, or at least against the Department of the Environment, that has extended over many, many cases, both civil and criminal, over 10 or 15 years. Uh, so if litigation privilege is going to apply, um, we need to know how, how long it's going to apply for. Does it just end when, when the case itself ends or how related can a subsequent case, does a subsequent case have to be before, um, um, in order to have the, the litigation privilege continue? So paragraph 36 is the important ruling on this question. The common law litigation privilege comes to an end absent closely related proceedings upon the termination of the litigation that gave rise to the privilege. Because every document over which litigation privilege is claimed was prepared for a specific case. Um, so it's the, it's the closely related is the key test here. As long as the ongoing cases are closely related, uh, the privilege will continue. So once it's all over, right? Once all the related, closely related cases are over, blank is certainly going to be able to get everything subject to the Access to Information Act because the, the government's claim will no longer be able to stand. Paragraph 39 um, tells us a bit more about what uh, what cases are um, are related or closely related. Um, and um, we'll go through that in detail, but, uh, but, but closely related is, uh, uh, is the, the, the thrust of the test. Okay, so it's now time to apply this, um, this law to Blank's particular circumstances. The feds, you recall, were pursuing him for environmental offenses at his factory. That prosecution of him generated these documents, these internal documents in the Department of the Environment. Now, he is uh, the plaintiff, right? He's, as I said, trying to turn the tables. Now he's suing the government, alleging um, negligent prosecution and some other things. Um, and it's not the same case as the government's prosecution, but is it closely related enough, right? Is his lawsuit against the government closely enough related to the government's original prosecution of him such that the litigation privilege for documents arising from the original government prosecution of him are still privileged. Paragraph 43, the answer is no. The minister's claim of privilege concerns documents that were prepared for the dominant purpose of a criminal prosecution related to environmental matters, whereas the respondent's action seeks civil redress for the manner in which the government conducted that prosecution. It springs from a different juridical source and is in that sense unrelated to the litigation of which the privilege claim was born. Okay, so complicated case going back and forth. Let me see if people 
get the um, uh, the upshot of this show responses right so uh, you're right no is correct blank wins the government loses um, it's a different matter therefore the stuff that they prepared from that original prosecution is no longer protected by litigation privilege it would have been protected by litigation privilege beforehand when they were still doing that original case uh, but it's uh, it's over now and he gets the documents a little bit more here on um, uh, details on, on, on this, uh, you know, abusive process, kind of like with solicit client privilege, we're not going to be, um, great, great phrase actually, it's not a black hole from which evidence of one's own misconduct can never be exposed to the light of day. And they're very um, cognizant, courts are, uh, of, of the risk this can be used to shield evidence of wrongdoing, and that they're not going not gonna to stand for that. And litigation privilege won't cast a veil over uh, over abusive behavior. Okay, so I think uh, we'll move on. Unless there's any questions about litigation privilege, uh, there's some more details here um, that I won't belabor about, about litigation privilege. But it's uh, it's definitely one to uh, to keep in mind as a way to uh, to protect a public interest uh, in in privacy, even when uh, when solicitor client privilege doesn't apply. Okay, so a third form of privilege that we'll talk about very briefly is settlement privilege. And what this means is that any communication about settlement are privileged. So uh, any letter which makes an offer to settle a case going between civil adversaries is privileged. And that can't be, no one can compel that to be disclosed, no matter how relevant it may be to matters in dispute. You may recall uh, Rule 49.06 um, from way back at the beginning, which said that you can't, um, in your pleadings, uh, disclose anything about settlement offers. This is part of the same policy. We want to create a private sphere in which settlement discussions can occur. And we don't want parties um, saying, look, judge and jury, the other side offered to settle this case with me. That proves that they know they did something wrong. We don't want that because that's going to disincentivize settlement offers from being made in the first place. So, uh, so this is the same policy. And that's why you'll sometimes see um, letters uh, which have the title without prejudice that's meant to remind the other party that it's subject to settlement privilege and that whatever concessions your client might be making in that settlement offer uh, does not prejudice does not undermine or cannot be taken uh, cannot be used against your client if your client goes to court and asserts a different position than the one that they're offering to settle on in that letter that brings us to case by case privilege and the case of MA versus Ryan. So, uh, so the first paragraph of this case uh, states the key facts and the question very clearly. After having been sexually assaulted by the respondent, Dr. Ryan, the appellant sought counseling from a psychiatrist. So the psychiatrist is Dr. Parfit. Right? It's important not to confuse the two doctors. Uh, the bad Dr. Ryan is the one who committed the sexual abuse. Dr. Parfit is the psychiatrist who is trying to, who, who is helping the plaintiff. And the question on this appeal is whether the psychiatrist, Dr. Parfit's notes and records containing statements the appellant made in the course of treatment are protected from disclosure in a civil suit brought by the appellant against Dr. Ryan. Put in terms of principle, should a defendant's right to relevant material to the end of testing the plaintiff's case outweigh the plaintiff's expectations that communications between her and her psychiatrist will be kept in confidence? So we saw when we were talking about um, discovery that your own privacy is not, in most cases, a good enough reason to avoid disclosing relevant documents. So you remember Leduc versus Romain, right? The private Facebook profile case where um, uh, this plaintiff 
you know, if he uh, he's chosen to keep his pictures private on Facebook, but the fact that he wants those pictures to be private is not good enough to shield them from disclosure if they are relevant, right? If they would help the court decide whether his claim of being unable to pursue recreational activities is true or not. But here we have a much, much stronger privacy interest, right? We have records from psychiatric counseling, which was undertaken with regard to the very same sexual abuse, which gave rise to the plaintiff's claim against Dr. Ryan. The plaintiff went to Dr. Parfit because of the personal trauma in the wake of this abuse. And what's more, there's evidence in this case that, um, that MA was quite concerned about the question of, of privacy, right? So she, uh, she asked Dr. Parfit whether, whether it would be kept confidential or not. And Dr. Parfit, uh, the psychiatrist, responded carefully that everything possible would be done to ensure that their discussions would remain confidential. And Dr. Parfit made these notes of their, of their, of their uh, consultations. And it would, be a, it would seem like a, a grotesque invasion of MA's privacy if that's now going to, going to be disclosed, right? And a, a source of, of very severe re-victimization of the plaintiff. So that's the plaintiff's argument for, uh, for, for not disclosing. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the test for relevance? Because that's the first thing to consider, right? Before we even get into privilege, nothing will ever be disclosed unless it's relevant. Who can remind us what our, what our test for relevance in, a, in civil litigation is? Uh, guano, okay. Guano is uh, is one name. On, on the exam, I'll be hoping to see at least Peruvian guano in brackets. I don't need the whole citation. Guano is not quite enough. Uh, lots of lots of guano out there. We're looking for the Peruvian guano. Um, and who can give us some substance of that that test of relevance? Okay. Yes, that's uh, that's good. Um, that may advance or damage a party's a party's case. Okay. So. If you're, uh, if you're the lawyer for the defendant, for Dr. Ryan, who committed this sexual abuse, but you're arguing this procedural motion about discovery, what is your argument for requiring production of this material? Why, why is this material relevant and why might it pass the Peruvian guano test? Okay, so the public... Uh, interest in the proper administration of justice. Yes, that's the, that's the general idea. Um, uh, yes, okay, so Sarah's got an important part of, part of it here, right? Uh, there's a consent argument. The, defense, the defendant says uh, the plaintiff consented to this, uh, to this sexual activity. And the plaintiff's account, what the plaintiff told the psychiatrist, may, um, may provide evidence of that. So consent, of course, does not excuse the crime right because the plaintiff was a minor and because there was a power relationship between her and her doctor so uh, so um, reported consent would never would not be criminally relevant but consent would still be relevant to the tort suit which we're uh, which we're talking about here uh, because it, it, it would um, it basically comes down to the damages right um, uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be battery and um, um, the the, uh, the extent to which MA's psychological uh, trauma is attributable to the defendant may depend on um, on consent and may also depend. Um, this is the other reason why the document might be relevant on the um, uh, on on her her situation and her mental health before the assault occurred. Right, so so paragraph three, uh, MA is um, claiming for uh, for mental distress and anguish, loss of dignity, humiliation, embarrassment, uh, difficulty in forming and maintaining relations with other persons, um, and and all of these uh, you know are, are sources of monetary damages. But if she, in her counseling sessions with with uh, with Doctor Parfit, said um, you know that she had difficulty forming and maintaining relationships. 
before she even met Dr. Ryan, then that would reduce her damages, right? Because some part of what she's experiencing now will no longer be his fault. So it's not about denying that she suffers these things, but it's about denying that his conduct caused it. Again, not relevant to the criminal case, or potentially irrelevant to the criminal case, but quite relevant potentially to the civil case where it's about the quantum of her damages. Okay, um, so Ryan wants uh, production of the file. He's got a pretty good argument for why it might be relevant uh, to the consent issue and to the damages issue. Um, this case arose under BC law, but it's the same policy of disclosing everything relevant subject to privileged claims. Um, and uh, the court, um, I already gave you this kind of general proposition, the idea of privileges. Uh, they go through these three. None of these three things is going to help M.A., right? There was no lawyer involved in her consultation with Dr. Parfit. Uh, she did not see Dr. Parfit in order to prepare her position for this tort suit. She saw Dr. Parfit because of her psychological trauma and, and mental health issues. And uh, nor was her conversation with Dr. Parfit, nor did it have anything to do with settlement discussions. Uh, but this is not the end of the story, right? The common law is always supposed to be able to adapt and change. In paragraph 21, the Supreme Court tells us that, uh, just like other parts of the common law, the law of privilege may evolve to reflect the social and legal realities of our time. That means we're going to continue or consider a new type of privilege for cases like this. So what are what are the social and legal realities of our time, uh, or rather of the time when this case was, uh, was issued, uh, 1997, which the Supreme Court says justify considering a new privilege in this case? Why does the court say that, you know, if this were 1937, things might be different, but now it's 1997, we have no social and legal realities. What are those? social and legal realities that they talk about. Uh, that um, increasing concern with the wrongs perpetrated by sexual abuse. So more and more of these cases were coming to light in the 90s, including institutional cases um, and, and, uh, and, and cases like this involving medical professionals. Um, so that's there, the laws take account of that. Uh, and um, there's also a uh, increasing extension of mental assistance from treatment of the physical effects to treatment of mental and emotional aftermath. So developments in the field of, uh, of, um, of psychiatry, which were, were meant, which were developing new ways to respond to trauma and to reduce its long-term effects on people. And then finally, as Jeremy said, the charter. So this is kind of, this is kind of um, odd, perhaps. Um, the charter is basically about constraining state action and stopping the government from infringing people's rights. The government is not a part of this case. So why is it that the charter is nonetheless relevant? Why are we talking about the charter in a case? There's no, there's no cops here. There's no law that's um, asserted to be a contravention of anyone's charter rights. In a sense, there is a state actor here, right? Because the court uh, is itself part of the government, and a court order is a form of state action. So if they were to compel her to disclose this, in a sense, that would be a state agent potentially infringing on her charter rights if they're at stake. And also, as Danielle says, um, the charter, the, the Supreme Court has told us again and again, is meant to sort of infuse the way the common law develops, even when it's not per se a charter in the sense, sense of state action. The common law must reflect charter values. So uh, paragraph 30, we get into what some of these charter values are. Um, privacy is the obvious one, right? We have the privacy interest affirmed by section eight of the charter. Um, you know, this is very much a, a question, a highly private document, and, and we're talking about com the government compelling her to disclose it. And uh, and secondly, um, and it's a bit more of a, a bit more of a stretch, but uh, but section 15, right? The right of every person embodied in section 15 of the Charter to equal treatment and benefit of the law. 
So this is kind of a kind of a subtle argument for what exactly Section 15 of the Charter has to do with this. But what they're getting at is that if we had uh, if we had a rule requiring the automatic disclosure of doctors uh, doctors documents, right? Then that rule would fall harder on sexual assault plaintiffs who are usually women than it would on other plaintiffs right so you remember um like you can compare it again to the little duke and roman case right where luke um said he broke his leg so he can't go water skiing um and you know john leduc would have seen a general practitioner or an orthopedic surgeon about his leg and there would have been relevant documents from that um from that doctor so it's about a comparison of like you know leduc versus ma under a rule of automatic disclosure of medical records so for leduc it's not that big a deal right i mean it's just his leg Right, uh, and it's a little bit of an infringement to have the eyes of his leg be disclosed to the insurance company, but not such a big deal. This is totally different, right? This is this is sexual assault. This is um, you know highly uh, embarrassing and, and traumatizing material that would constitute re-traumatization of the plaintiff for it to be disclosed. So, so the section 15 point is that sexual assault claimants. Um, are overwhelmingly women and they are uh, a category in of themselves and a hypothetical rule requiring full disclosure of these documents would fall much harder on them than it would on the Ladukes of the world with less uh, sensitive traumatizing injuries so that's kind of what they're getting at here right that's an example of it's sort of a subtle argument based on the hypothetical of how argument for how developing the common law in one way would be more in accordance with section 15 values um, even though it's not a strict application of the section 15 test of the type you you're familiar with from uh, from constitutional law okay so that's the charter value so so this all brings us to the wigmore test which is our test for uh for cases like this where um where none of those other three forms of privilege apply. Um, because just because we have charter value table, that doesn't mean we're going to throw away normal reasoning. We have this mechanism. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, to for this to apply, the communication must originate in a confidence, so it still can't be sort of public information that the world is already familiar with. Uh, the confidence must be essential to the relationship in which the communication arises. Relationship in which that communication arises must be one which should be sedulously fostered in the public, which is to say one which has important public interest benefits. And finally, if these requirements are met, the court must consider whether the interests served by protecting the communications from disclosure outweigh whoops, the interest in getting at the truth and disposing properly of the litigation. So that's our test for this case-by-case -case, uh, privilege, the, the Wigmore test. So um, they now apply this to, uh, to, to the case at hand. So clearly, branch one has passed, uh, that uh, the communications were made in confidence. The, um, uh, and the appellant, as, as we know, uh, clearly um, it was important to her that they be uh, confidential, and Dr. Parfit was doing everything she could to protect them. Um, the uh, everyone agrees that this type of counseling would not occur unless the confidentiality were there people would not come come forward to to engage in this type of, of counseling if they couldn't protect privacy um it's a relationship to branch three uh which should be sedulously fostered right it's kind of like going to see your lawyer we were talking about the solicitor client privilege um and, and the the public interest at stake there Similarly, this is a professional consultation between a person and a psychiatrist, which is important and, and valuable, and perhaps in particular when you're talking about people who are recovering from, from trauma. And here, um, we're, we're on, on branch four, right, where we're talking about, um, about it's basically a weighing, a weighing test. Um, this includes the effects of, uh, of confidentiality or, or effects of divulging information on 
MA herself, but it's also about a chain effect, right? The effect that the finding of no privilege would have on the ability of other persons suffering from similar trauma to obtain needed treatment and psychiatrists to provide it. So basically, it's not just about MA, that if we don't uphold this, and that sort of message gets out, and psychiatrists are required in good faith to tell their patients that they can't guarantee privacy because the contents of their conversation are disclosed, there's almost nothing you could do that would that would be that would have an effect on deterring people from coming forward and having these consultations in the first place. But it's balancing, so we gotta look at the other hand, right? Extending privilege may mean that courts will become the tools of injustice rather than unearthing the truth where it is available to be found, right? Because if you grant privilege, you are suppressing the disclosure of relevant documents. And if MA really were suffering from all of these negative effects before Dr. Ryan assaulted her, it's not fair to require Dr. Ryan, or more accurately, Dr. Ryan's insurer, to pay for all of them, right? And that secret envelope might reveal that she said exactly that to her doctor. Okay, so it's rock and a hard place, right? Either we allow the privilege, undermine the search for truth, risk an unjust verdict, or we destroy the privilege. We, we, we say there is no privilege, which means we are undermining privacy and charter values and all of these um, very important things that seem to be pushing in that direction. So the route between the rock and harp comes at paragraph 33, we're two minutes away from being done here, um, where it's an order for partial privilege, right? Uh, kind of like in the Alameda case, we saw Master Brock's judgment, where um, you're going to, uh, there's a compelling privacy interest, but there's also reasons to disclose, where we li disclose a limited number of documents, we edit them, edit the documents to, uh, to ensure that the most probative, valuable stuff comes out while the private stuff stays um, stays confidential. And other takes, um, like, you know, keeping documents in a particular secure location and requiring only one lawyer from the other side, letting only one lawyer from the other side have access to it, um, and, and so forth. Right, so you don't really need to know the details of what they did here. Um, the takeaway from this case is that uh, this Wigmore test does exist to extend the privilege on a case-by-case -case basis, and that whenever you have a disclosure motion and you've got compelling interests on both sides, this remedy of a partial disclosure order, including these techniques the court talks about, um, is available as a way to try to square the circle and, uh, and get a route between the rock and, uh, and the court and, and the hard place between them. Okay, so I think, um, I think that's uh, all I have to say. Okay, so um, uh, thanks very much for, uh, for being with me today and, uh, and have a terrific weekend.